I'm going to talk about a, a relatively newer project in our lab, kind of a natural progression in our, if based on our interest in roots and root biology and the role of root traits and adaptation to uh, marginal soils. So I'm going to be talking about our work. So it's going to be partly a techniques talk, talking about as we're developing and trying to improve ways to phenotype roots with better throughput and better precision and accuracy and with more information for, in order to do genetic mapping from which we can mine you know, molecular and physiological traits and then turn around and hopefully that information can be used for, for plant breeding. So I thought I'd start with a, a outline of the talk. I'm gonna start off talking about why we started oh, about six, seven years ago with uh, digital phenotyping imaging of roots and it was our work on rice aluminum tolerance that uh, my collaboration started a, a great collaboration with Susan Bakucha's lab and I won't go into much detail with that because Lisa Marone talked about that work uh, last week in this seminar series. And then I'll talk about um, our development of a system to image and analyze root system architecture in three dimensions, move on to how we use that system to do some genetic mapping, genome-wide mapping of rice root system architecture. And then when we tried to move on to study other species, it was necessary to improve the system. In fact, the system's still pretty crude and there's a lots of improvement and we're constantly trying to improve it. Um, and ultimately, we'd like to come up with a system that'll allow us and others and plant breeders ultimately to get root traits in situ from the field. So start off, you've seen some of these slides last week. Aluminum toxicity, my lab's been studying that for about 25 years. Highly acid soils, these red zones are highly acid soils, pH of five and below, and you can see they're very extensive, particularly here in the uh, tropics and subtropics where many of the developing countries reside. And on these aluminum toxic soils, these dark green issue uh, areas overlay with that are, are aluminum toxic soils. And aluminum toxicity, results in a very rapid inhibition of root growth shown in this, this aluminum sensitive near isogenic uh, line. And that ultimately because of drought and mineral nutrient deficiencies and drought stress, you can get significant yield reductions on acid aluminum toxic soils. So for uh, a long time, we quantified root growth. Here's some sorghum roots, tolerant sensitive sorghum roots, by measuring the longest root on about a five-day-old seedling with a ruler. And uh, Jeringer Magoyais is in the audience. He was one of my PhD students and now a longtime collaborator. It worked out pretty well. With that approach, we were able to map base clone the first gene in sorghum, which turned out to be the major aluminum tolerance gene, SB mate. But it's pretty crude. Um, and when, a number of years back, Adam Famoso, one of Susan's PhD students, said, hey, I want to work on rice aluminum tolerance. And I, and this really started a great collaboration. As Susan has now seen the light, and, and we collaborate on another project on abiotic stress tolerance. Um, and so we started working on rice. And uh, one thing that we found out right away is as we grew these young rice seedlings, they tend to be a more prolific and finely divided root system. You know, where's that? There is a longest root, but there's lots of other roots. Where in maize and sorghum, we may only have a, a, a primary root and a few seminal roots. But here's another issue. So. In this particular genotype, here's its root growth in the absence of aluminum and in the presence of aluminum. So you can see aluminum toxicity has knocked out lateral root growth. But if we measure the longest root based on that relative root growth measurement of longest root, it wasn't hardly inhibited at all, um, we would say this one was aluminum resistant. So it realized we needed to phenotype the entire root system. And we had another really smart graduate student, Randy Clark, in my lab. He kind of grew up in my lab, started his first day as an undergraduate in biological engineering and then a technician. And then he went to get a PhD here in biological engineering. So he started our root imaging with imaging roots for root growth. This is our root reader 2D system. And so what we did here is we grow our plants hydroponically as we always do. And I think this is where you know, John Schaff gets involved. They came up with a nice way to grow the plants in these little floating foams so we can easily take them out, image the roots, put them back in so we can follow root growth over time. We just use a, a light box stand. We have a, a polarized filter on the light box. The, 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 the root system goes on top of that. And then another polarizing filter at the camera at right angles. And this maximized 
the contrast between the white root and the black background to really get good uh, image uh, quality and be able to quantify roots nicely. And so we can image about 1,000 root systems a day with this, with a couple people working. And then at night, the Root Reader 2D software in batch mode can quantify total root length. And so with that, for the rice aluminum tolerance mapping, we were able to quantify aluminum tolerance on about 12,000 plants. And, I know, um, and so just a little bit about Root Reader 2D. Um, so right now, the, the focus is on root growth traits and some root morphology traits. So we can quantify root growth of the whole system. Or you can, there's a nice user interface if you want to measure root growth on selected root types, you can do that. Um, and as I, we can measure other, of course, it automatically acquires things like root diameter and things like that and root density. And we can add other traits like root angle. I think it wouldn't be that hard to add. And so, again, the throughput of this was really nice because, we again, this 1,000 plants a day, I mean, that's a lot of work, but it's very doable. And uh, so this is, again, the measure is relative root growth, which is root growth in aluminum solution divided by control root growth. And this is different cereals at three different aluminum AL3 plus activities, not concentration, but the thermodynamic activity. And you can see, even at this 160 micromolar, which in this solution was about one millimolar aluminum, rice is much more aluminum tolerant than the other cereals. You've got a relative root growth of about 60% at this high level. And so using uh, this, again, this collaboration with Susan, and then of course she collaborates with Jason Meese on the statistical side of things. So um, we, uh, um, Adam and Randy phenotyped Susan's initial rice diversity panel, RDP1, which had about 400 um, domestic uh, rice uh, lines. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, Lisa, you talked about this at your, your seminar. So I'm just going to show, again, I'm not, this was the Manhattan plot. We, we can gather some information from GWAS. We look at the whole population, but more information if we do it by subpop. And we've got a lot of interesting peaks that overlap with candidate aluminum tolerance genes that others had identified by, by either forward genetics and then knocking them out, but no variation had identified for them. And in essence, we validated a number of these aluminum tolerance genes that actually went in with some of them and studied them and showed, for example, with this aluminum transporter that ver genetic variation in it and it confers a sensitive and tolerant haplotype that results in better or weaker aluminum transport and better or less aluminum tolerance. So again, again, I'm just focusing here on the root imaging. This root reader 2D made this kind of an analysis uh, possible. OK, so now I'm going to move on to kind of looking at roots in three dimensions, root system architecture. There's a growing awareness, it's been there for a while, that the spatial distribution of a root system in three dimensions in the soil, which we call root system architecture, plays a, an important role in many important agronomic traits, particularly the ac ac acquisition of mineral nutrients and water under limiting conditions. And so a lot of this was based on the pioneering work of root, the role of root system architecture in phosphorus topsoil foraging and phosphorus efficiency. My definition of phosphorus efficiency, because I'll be talking about it more, is if it's phosphorus efficient, it's a genetically based ability to maintain yield in a low pea soil. And phosphorus inefficient, you'll get a lower, a lesser yield. And finding that this phosphorus efficiency, a big part of this is surface soil phosphorus foraging by the root system. Work from Jonathan Lynch's lab at Penn State and Hong Liao's lab at South China Agricultural University. And here's what we're talking about. There's all sorts of traits that can be involved in phosphorus efficiency. Phosphate is one of the most immobile nutrients in the soil. It moves very slowly. It tends to bind to aluminum and iron oxides on the surface of clay minerals, particularly in acid soils where they're highly weathered. And so what, you get a lot of phosphorus fixation in the topsoil. And what they found with bean and soybean that genotypes that put more roots, lateral roots out, kind of ageotropic roots that go out instead of down, put the roots where the phosphorus is, and then they can work their magic to make it available and take it up. This is an important part of phosphorus efficiency. And I'll just show you that in kind of simplified fashion. Hong Liao is another close collaborator of ours. She's actually just moved to Fujian Agricultural Forestry University to start a new root biology center. So she screened the, uh, the Chinese uh, germplasm collection, soybean germplasm collection for pea efficiency. And so here she has a pea efficient and a pea inefficient 
uh, line on an acid soil where they've fertilized with phosphorus, so you can see they grow equally well, but with no phosphorus or little phosphorus fertilizer, the P efficient line does much better than the P inefficient line. When she looked at the root of the P efficient line, they had a significant uh, cadre of these ageotropic roots that go out into that P fixed topsoil. And then they have a subset of deeper roots to get water. And the inefficient lines tended to have, like the local, the breeding lines that the farmers use there, mostly just deep roots. And so she was one of the first to start a root breeding program, breeding for improved traits via root breeding. So we're doing back cross breeding and recurrent selection to integress this, this trait into the locally adapted varieties. And they've released now, I think, five uh, lines, five new varieties to the farmers that are being used. And they're getting significant yield increases on these low P acid soils of South China. So there's an example. So if you have something like that's not very immobile, you're going to want an architecture like that. And if you're talking about water that's really mobile, you're going to want deeper roots. And if you're talking about both stresses, I guess you're going to need both types of roots. But I'm not going to talk about it because of time, but uh, um, uh, Kazu Uga, who was here on a sabbatical with Susan and I for a year, he cloned the first deep rooting gene in rice. And it confers um, geotropic response to the crown roots. And, when you're expressing that good, the good allele of that, they're considerably better yield under drought. OK, so that's the justification for why we're all now interested in root architecture in the face of climate change. Um, so I'm going to talk about how to phenotype roots. You know, kind of the classical phenotyping techniques are things like digging big trenches and looking at the roots down the side of the trench, soil coring to take out the soil and roots, putting mini rhizotrons in the soil and cam photographing the roots that grow along the transparent uh, cylinder. Or you know, a lot of people now are doing what we call shovelomics, and, uh, digging up lots of crowns of like maize roots and washing them <laughs> off and trying to image them digitally. Yeah, I thought Jonathan Lynch had termed that, but it turns out Tom Mitchell Olds did. We, are, we were all collaborating on some root stuff at one time. OK, so if you look at the techniques for phenotyping roots, and you look at them as a function of throughput on the x-axis and real versus artificial, you can see all the more kind of real world things are low throughput. And the techniques that give you the throughput necessary are very artificial, like we grow in gel, we grow in hydroponics, mini rhizotrons. And also, these techniques provide you the kind of quantitative detail you need for the kind of mapping we want to do. I'm going to talk later about X-ray computed tomography, because this is a pro very promising technique for imaging roots and soil. It's getting faster. It's getting more detail. It's not there yet. But I, we have hope for that in the, in the, in the next five years, because ultimately, we like to be able to phenotype our roots and soil. But for now, we started off by phenotyping in a transparent gel. OK, and this is rice seedling in a transparent gel with nutrient solution. That held the 3D architecture. So this system, the initial system, it a, uses a, a digital camera with fixed capture settings. It's a stationary camera. And your gel system is sitting in a tank, a rectangular tank filled with water. That minimizes the uh, distortion due to the curvature of the cylinder. And it's sitting on a kind of an independent magnet controlled rotational motor. computer automatically takes a picture, then rotates the uh, root system a fixed amount of time, takes another picture, and then you take, for example, now we take 100 pictures as it's rotated 360 degrees. So it rotated 3.6 degrees for each picture. And then the root reader 3D software has algorithms that will, will both first uh, threshold and then skeletonize the these series of, say, 100 2D root images. And then other al algorithms will convert these 100 2D images, each with a slightly different perspective of the root system, into a 3D root reconstruction. And then we, we, we put in the kind of root traits we want to have the system automatically quantify. And so here is an example of um, uh, 3D reconstructions of a upland rice, Azucena, adapted to a more dry agricultural environment, and a paddy rice, IR64, adapted to flooded environment. We measure we a 13 traits that we've now focused in on in terms of root architecture. One of the most useful is centroid, which is the vertical 
this yellow dot is the, ver the distance from the center of mass of the root system to the, to the seed. So the bigger the centroid value, the deeper the root system. So this azucena has a deeper root system. And then we validated these differences, the deeper versus more shallow in soil. And for some reason, this, I'm going to go back because that, something in that program, and that doesn't let me, well, I'm going to go forward again. That's reversing. Okay. So we validated these by growing. John collaborated with Craig Sturrock from Malcolm Bennett's lab at the University of Nottingham. They have one of these X-ray CT machines, and we grew Azucena and IR64 in soil. And you can see an image did in soil with the X-ray CT scanner that the Azucena, and again, is quite a bit deeper than the IR64. So the gel system you know, work, works pretty well in terms of, I think, giving us a real-world uh, root architecture differences. OK, so we went ahead, like the aluminum tolerance, and we phenotyped Susan's uh, RDP-1 association panel for 13 core traits that describe different, quantitatively different aspects of root architecture in terms of depth and spread it outedness and, uh, and root density, et cetera, root length, et cetera. Um, and it took them uh, well over a year, as was um, Randy and working with uh, Janelle Jung, uh, who was particularly interested in the, in the wild rice. That was her PhD in Susan's uh, lab, the wild rice members of the association panel. OK, and then here's the association uh, panel. And again, it's divided you know, genetically into the different subpopulations. And we have found that it's really important to analyze them via individual subpops, along with all together to get the maximum amount of information. So what do we get from this? Here's 13 of the 260 Manhattan plots across the 12 chromosomes. This is for the 13 root traits at one time point. So we have 260 of these, because we have 13 traits by five different subpopulation groupings by four different time points. So an enormous amount of data, lots of small peaks. Which ones are real? Which ones are important? Maybe they're all important. So we had an overwhelming a lot of work. And Randy was working with a visiting professor in our lab from Brazil, Alexandre Falco, who was on sabbatical, works on uh, computer imaging in the medical field, and he, he's now interested in roots. And they went through a whole bunch of different approaches, including multi-trait analysis and meta-analyses. We narrowed in on three regions of the genome that we think could be important in conditioning differences in root architecture trait that might have relevance to, ag to agro agronomic traits. The first one is on uh, chromosome 3. And it's here. And these peaks, there, none of them are that big. I think the, uh, the threshold, the statistical threshold is somewhere, I think, between around, around 5. Um, and so uh, this peak here um, is core, significantly correlated with rooting depth traits, like centroid, et cetera, OK, and in the indica subpopulation. So what Randy did was, you know, because the Illumina chip, you know, you get two different alleles of each SNP. So she, he went to the, um, yeah, excuse me, damn thing. So he went to this peak SNP here. And what he did was that at that peak SNP, he selected all of the indicas, there are 44 of them, that had one allele, the A allele, and then the other 107 indicas that had the B allele. And he, s he collected all the ones that had the A allele and superimposed their root architectures, and that's what you get in the 107 that have the B allele. And you can see that it looks, suggests that there's something in this region around here that conditions a significant difference in root depth. And as he moves far enough away from this uh, peak SNP, so the out of linkage, linkage disequilibrium with that SNP, you see that difference disappear. So it does suggest it's not really validation, but it's strongly you know, supporting that this could be an important region that we'll look at in more detail. A second peak on chromosome 4. Uh, was found across all subpopulations only, not the individual subpops. And it's uh, associated, again, with rooting depth traits. So what he did here is a little different. He used one of uh, Susan's, uh, I think, her um, interaggression tool. But he looked at what he did is he organized 
These are all the centroid values for the different members, the different subpopulations by color. So these are the Aush. These are the Indica and the temperate and tro tropical Japonica. So if you look at the Indica, and then there are, some, there are some blue ones. Those are ones that at this region where the peak snip is had a Japonica introgression. And they're all down here, suggesting that when you have a Japonica introgression, you make a shorter or less deep root system. So again, it did the same kind of analysis I showed you before. And sure enough, we see a significant difference in, in rooting depth when they have the Japonica introgression in these, uh, in these um, indicas. And then the third peak is no, nearby. And this one's interesting, because instead of depth, it, it is associated with a root branching, propagation angle traits. So things about me as a root system more spread out or more solid. And I asked Randy why. He only used one here. He thought it would look clearer. But uh, so here, if you have the one allele, you have a more spread out root system. And here, you have a more condensed root system. So maybe, if, you know, particularly if you can push this out further, maybe this one would do better on a low P soil where the P fixation is in the top soil. So to summarize this section, um, so the joint, we did both joint linkage and genome-wide association analysis, identified these three promising regions that appear to possibly condition important differences in root architecture that we'll study, we're going to study further and do fine mapping of these. Um, I want to make it important, of course, we had important to verify that what we see in gel occurs in soil, and we val validated for some of these, but then uh, to make sure that this is something that's not an artifact of roots growing in, in the gel media. <laughs> and then ultimately, if we get, if these are real differences, do they have any impact on crop performance under certain conditions? OK, so from there, we moved on to our sorghum association panel that Geringer and I, we've been collaborating, Geringer Magoyais, on for a number of years. We use it for aluminum tolerance and now P efficiency, and he's the lead on that. Um, and but what we found is, you know, even though rice, here's five different rice lines, you can see the nice variation in architecture, grow well in this gel and gum medium. Sorghum and maize do not grow anywhere as well. The roots are stunted, their tips are swollen, and it's not due to oxygen levels down here. John Schaff went in with an oxygen mini electrode and found there's still 14% oxygen at the bottom. I think it's high ethylene. And that is because the gel is going to retard ethylene release from the root. And I suspect that maize and sorghum, not surprisingly, are more sensitive to high ethylene. Because that is a phenotype of high ethylene, is these stunted roots. Bottom line is, this system won't work well for most other species. So I remember John one day was going, well, could we make a plastic mesh? And you know that will allow the roots to grow, but it'll hold their architecture. We could do this in, in hydroponics. And sure enough, that works. So John's our idea guy when it comes to these sorts of things. So between John and Randy and Alexandre, they developed the mesh system. And this is a 15-day-old sorghum plant. Um, and then we would do our 2D, we do our collect our 100 2D images. We would uh, threshold them and skeletonize them. And then Alexander wrote a separate program that would remove the image of the mesh, so you have these gaps in there. But this is a 3D reconstruction. We can now grow any plant species. We can look at the architecture traits. Um, we can do bigger plants now. We can impose different nutrient stresses. So it's really opened up a lot more for us. We knew we knew need to improve this, because this doesn't allow us to measure things like root length with our 3D system because of the cuts. And we're working on that, as I'll show you later. And just show you this, the plastic mesh is made with a 3D printer, printed from plastic stock. And we can play around with the configuration. Turns out this configuration is better than this for allowing the roots to grow through. And here's one of the towers. And here's a young sorghum seedling starting to grow. And so, you know, we can now, we don't have to grow them in these, pla in these glass gel uh, cylinders, and we don't have to image them, and that greatly improves the, the quality of the images. So we can grow a number of these towers in a big hydroponic tank, just lift them out and put them into our water-filled imaging tank, and then put them back in the, in the growing hydroponic tank. And this just shows rice, soybean, sorghum being grown in the system. They all grow quite nicely. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about improving the system. So here's our existing system that Randy built. And uh, so what we have here is here is the water-filled tank. And it's got 
It's got the uh, it's got a, a, a the turntable here and the mesh system. We've now improved it with LED lights. John developed this as opposed to the previous uh, fluorescent lights. And then this is all mounted on a uh, with a camera on a vibration-free table. And then you have a separate computer that controls the camera and the turntable and collects the data. So it's big and it's kind of awkward and it needs a dark room. So, you know, just like the biologist, you know, 10, 15 years ago started co collaborating with computer scientists, for this we need to not only collaborate with computer scientists but engineers and physicists. So we brought in our first uh, bona fide um, engineering postdoc about six months ago, Tyler Davis. And then we, we were able to s steal uh, a, a promising undergrad engineering student actually from RIT who's taken, a, he lives in Ithaca, goes to RIT, Nathaniel Shaw, who's taken a year off to work with us. And they're developing this new system, so it's much more condensed, it's all in its own uh, ultimately light tight area, um, so it doesn't require a dark room. Instead of a big computer, this little Raspberry Pi, the little $39, like size of a pack of cigarettes, controls uh, the, uh, the, um, the camera and the turntable. And they've improved, we got a, above, we, got, we drive the, the mesh towers from up above. So it's got a lot of improvements. Got a little movie that uh, Tyler and Nathaniel put together. It just shows that you can see the inside of the system a little bit. It's no big deal, but it's nice for me to take a break for a minute. So that would be viewing the roots in there. So and just the top view. This actually is, it, it's much, it's, it seems to move much better and I think we'll get better imaging. But we haven't, I guess right now, we're, 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 the imaging is just starting to be tested, if I, if I remember correctly. And then Dave Schneider, a lot of you know Dave, and uh, he's been, you know, our, our, our ARS computational and, and computational biology guru for many years, stole him away from Cornell. And I was able to steal him at least part-time to work on this project, and he's improving the root reader 2D software. Uh, one of the things he's done is come up with a new thresholding uh, that removes all of the image that is not root, including that mesh. So it's all taken out in one, one fell swoop, and this improves the uh, consistency and the sensitivity of the, of the system. There's less, you can see the fragmentation is much less. It's faster, it's more automated. So this is a nice, significant improvement in continue to work on improving the, the software. And this just shows, here's Oz Hussein growing in the gel, and here it is growing in the hydroponic mesh system. They have pretty similar architectures. In fact, quite similar. Okay, so we, we use this system to phenotype an association panel that Geringer had assembled of, of the U.S converted lines and some of the Brazilian lines. And this was part of Barbara Huffnagel's PhD with Jura. She did the 3D root architecture work in our lab, working with uh, one of our root imaging uh, uh, technical scientists, Brandon Larson. Uh, it took about a year to do the 3D imaging of the, uh, of the uh, association panel. I'm not gonna go into great detail with this because Jura is giving the PGS Fest, is PGS plant graduate student? I can't remember what PGS stands for. What is that? Post postgraduate. Okay, postgraduate student fest seminar at BTI, so it's hosting him. He'll be talking about the sorghum work uh, that he and we have together have been doing on acid soils in terms of aluminum toxicity and phosphorus deficiency tomorrow at 10 a.m. in the BTI auditorium. It'll be a really good seminar. So I'm just gonna go over this briefly. So we're interested in phosphorus efficiency and colleagues of ours, um, um, Sigrid Hoyer at Erie and, uh, and Matthias Visawa at Jerkus in Japan. They had identified a major phosphorus uptake efficiency QTL on chromosome 12 and about 10 years ago, and it took them like eight years to map base clone it. And it turned out that the gene underlying this QTL is a, is a uh, receptor kinase, they call it PISTOL1 for phosphorus starvation tolerance. And uh, when you express either in transgenics or in near isogenic lines, the superior allele, this is phosphorus uptake under plus P and, and minus P conditions in the near isogenic line versus the, the null. You can see there's a significant increase in phosphorus uptake under low P and high P conditions. And this turns into better biomass in the transgenic line versus the, the expressing the empty vector under low P soils. And it increases early root growth. So increases root growth, you're able to mine more of the phosphorus from the soil. So 
Um, what uh, Jura uh, looked at is he looked at, there's about 40 members of this uh, kinase family in sorghum. So he looked at a grouping that was close to Pistol 1. And he ended up, the most similar were uh, on chromosomes 3 and 7. And so he made uh, paralog specific SNPs to differentiate these these different uh, Pistol 1 homologs. And he's actually already converted them to the CAS system because one of his goals is as we make discoveries from this to be, make it available to plant breeders once he's validated them for crop improvement. We're doing that with the, he's doing that with our sorghum aluminum tolerance gene, SB mate. So I'm just gonna summarize the work that was published last year in Plant Phys in a couple of slides. So he phenotyped uh, Barbara, and, uh, so the, the panel was, phenotyped for P efficiency traits in the field in Brazil on low P and sufficient P soils, root growth morphology traits using the root reader 2D system that was set up in Jura's lab that they did. So that's in hydroponics. P uptake traits in hydroponics, the association panel. And then in my lab, the 3D root architecture traits under low P. And then candidate gene association analysis was used was conducted carrying out with these candidate genes. And they found alleles for one, one of the Pistol 1 genes associated with finer roots and enhanced P uptake, and alleles of another Pistol 1 gene associated with great, greater root surface area and increased grain yield, which is the ultimate trait we want on low P soils. So it looks very promising. And even more promising, so at the same time, we have collaborators at uh, Icrasat Mali um, Ava Veltsian and her group, and, and uh, Jura particularly has been collaborating with them. And they also phenotyped a panel of West African adapted sorghum varieties for sorghum tiller biomass and pea accumulation in low and sufficient pea soils in, in the greenhouse and conducted GWAS on that. And when we, we look at the, um, we found when we, com when we compare the two association studies, there's consistent allelic effects found for sorghum P efficiency between the two association panels in two different environments, Africa and Brazil, suggesting at least for one of these homologs, uh, relatively stable across genetic backgrounds and environments. And in Barbara's study indicated that multiple SP Pistol 1 genes play roles in modifying root architecture to acquire more phosphorus under low P. And as I said, Jura is developing markers for the superior Pistol 1 alleles for we'll put them through the genetic challenge program integrated breeding platform. And just, just shows the 3D root architecture of a P efficient and P inefficient sorghum genotype, probably the biggest difference. So you see these roots, this root system for the P efficient one is more, more proliferated in its uh, relatively shallow lateral roots. Okay, so now I'm gonna finish up a little bit about trying to start moving towards soil and soil-like media and what can we do and ultimately to the field. We're a long ways from that. So one of the things, again, one of John's brainstorms was, well, in the lab, there's a stuff called turf face. It's a calcined clay. It's been baked at 1,500 degrees. So it's kind of like a soil. It's clay. It's got different particle sizes, good porosity. It's a soil amendment like it's used in baseball fields, the infield to maintain so they don't get too wet. Um, and so the nice thing about it is we can use it as a soil-like matrix with our mesh and our roots, and you can grow it. It's at least sort of soil-like, and then you can wash the, uh, the uh, turf face away, and the roots are nice and clean, and you can image them, and you can reuse the turf face. And so this is an example that we're collaborating with Li Ching Yuan, who's a professor at China Agricultural University, and he's doing GWAS on maize in the field, and now we'll do it in our lab. So they grew maize in this turf face with the cylinders, with the, with the mesh cylinders, then they washed the turf face away and you could see and then they were able to image the, the root system. So it's not very high throughput, but if you could go from hydroponic, lots of lines to a few lines, and we're working out to see if we can impose water stress. We're meeting with some uh, professors over in engineering that have a nice uh, water potential sensor we think we'll be able to use to impose specific water stresses. Okay, I've mentioned the X-ray computed tomography. This is looking like a rapidly advancing technology. So roots attenuate X-rays just like they attenuate visible light. 
And so what the, here's the guts of an X-ray CT machine. These are expensive, they cost around a half a million to a million dollars. So you have an X-ray source, that'd be like your visible light source. You have a flat panel detector where we would have a digital camera. And this has a rotating platform. So again, you can image the roots with X-rays as you rotate them in growing in soil or soil-like materials. And then Malcolm Bennett's lab has developed root track software that like Root Reader 3D can extract 3D reconstructions. Here's one of a wheat root. Here's the actual wheat root, small young wheat plant. And then here's the 3D reconstruction. So it's still slow, takes a couple of hours. Uh, it still doesn't get all the detail, but it's advanced quite a bit in the last few years. And uh, John, again, has been collaborating with Craig Sturrock from Malcolm Bennett's lab. And here we have Azusena grown in turf face. Here's a 3D reconstruction, and here it is grown in soil in the 3D reconstruction. There's less uh, image in soil because soil is denser, and they're still not capturing all of the root uh, features uh, in soil, but it's getting there. Okay, so how do we, I should say, how do we image crop systems in soil, not the field, with a throughput to enable genetic and genome-wide mapping? You know, one thing is this whole shovelomics, so my friend Chris Topp, who's a new professor at Danforth, he's kind of semi-automated it with a modified uh, uh, harvester. So they harvest the crowns of maize plants. There they are washing them in the setting sun, and then they image them in, in the field. And then another group of scientists has developed a new software, DERP, Digital Imaging of Root Traits, for imaging shovelomics obtained roots and to try to get uh, reconstructions of those root systems and quantified root tapes with high throughput. The other thing Chris is doing is using the X-ray CT to image these shovelomics obtained maize roots and it's not gonna let me, uh, anyway, there was a movie of it moving around. But anyway, you can do that in about two minutes. So it does have the throughput and you can get a lot of detail. We'll see if that works. Ultimately, what we're really interested in is finding a tool that plant breeders can use to go out to the field, non-destructively, invasively, quantify at least root biomass maybe and root extent. And we think that's gonna be possible in the future. Um, so we're just noodling around. This is my next to last slide, my last kind of data slide. So people, it may end up being a new technology, one that's not being used for roots. And this is where we gotta start bringing together more engineers and physicists with computer scientists and plant biologists and plant breeders. But some people are looking at ground penetrating radar, which has been used for years. You can image thick tree roots and seeing if they can improve it in ways to maybe quantify crop uh, roots, and I have no idea. We're looking at, because we're also an electrophysiology lab, thanks to Miguel Pineros, there's an old tool, electrical impedance capacitance spectroscopy. It's been used since the 70s, showing you can quantify root biomass. And what you do is clamp an electrode to the stem of the plant, put another electrode in the soil or hydroponics around the roots, and you pass variable alternating frequency current, and it flows through the root system and up to this electrode. And somehow this is used to quantify, it looks like pretty successfully, at least in these simple systems, root biomass and root extent. And so Tyler uh, Davis is looking at this and looking at a company that's, uh, because this technology has been continued to be advanced, even though it's not been used on plants, it's used like to look for cracks in machine parts, et cetera, cast parts. So there's a company that may have a system that we could try. Because I can envision maybe this is something if it worked, could be maybe automated with a robot to go out in the field and measure root extent if we can simplify it enough. So to finish up, okay, so, um, we did it, both GWAS and I didn't show it, but also biparental linkage mapping of root, of rice uh, root system architecture and gel and gum. And we've identified several promising genomic regions that we gotta get going on studying further. It's been on hold for a bit. Um, because many of the other species roots didn't grow well in gel, we developed this new hydroponic based root system that looks very good and we're continuing to improve it. And then we used this system in collaboration with Geringer, used it to both our systems, the 2D and 3D systems for looking at candidate gene association analysis of root architecture's role in phosphorus efficiency. And again, I wanna verify, we know that this is not the real world. We need to validate anything pretty quickly, any differences in soil, and we've been doing that, as you can see, in some of our stuff. And then ultimately, we want to uh, 
you know, the X-ray CT is, looks very promising in terms of, uh, of, uh, of being able to uh, maybe be able to image with throughput in the next maybe in five years in soil. And, uh, and again, of course, we, we also hope to develop tools for imaging or at least quantifying root biomass and extent in the field. With that, I'll take any questions. Thanks.